we are waiting for this other person to magically change overnight. It's like we've been watching too many Disney movies and we think, oh my gosh, they're going to bump their hair tomorrow, get struck by lightning, and they're going to wake up a different person or in someone else's body and they'll be great. And it's like, that's not what happened with people. That thing that they did last week, they will continue to do that thing. So the change will happen on your part, not on theirs. That was Nedra Tawab on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, author of Act Daily Journal, The Act Daily Card Deck, and the upcoming book, Act for Burnout. I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist, assistant professor at Brown University, and author of the book, Work, Parent, Thrive. And from coastal New England, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty, The Big Book of Act Metaphors, and the upcoming Imposter No More. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. I'm here with Yael to introduce today's episode with Nedra Tawab, where we talk about how to handle family dysfunction. And we had Nedra on the podcast a couple years ago to talk about her boundaries book that was for general relationships. And now she's written a book about how to deal with family relationships. There's a lot of cool information in this episode, little nuggets. And I was thinking a lot about like once we have an understanding that maybe there's been some dysfunction in our family of origin. Maybe we even see the way that that has played out. We see the impacts of it. And maybe we know, like we're at the point that we need to do something differently. We need to set some boundaries, but we're not really sure exactly how or what to do. And so I thought it might be useful for Yael and I to talk a little bit about that in this intro. Family dysfunction has been something that we've been doing more of. And we actually have a recent episode with Stephanie Kreisberg on adult daughters of narcissistic mothers, and then my interview with Lindsay Gibson on adult children of emotionally immature parents. And this is just a really complicated issue that many, many people tangle with. And I think um, the more that we can talk about really strategic, concrete tools to manage family dysfunction, you know, the more equipped that we're going to be even in the midst of, you know, a situation that we don't, that we really don't have control over. So I I just have think that it's so wonderful that Nedra is out there talking about it and offering skills. And I do think, you know, having some concrete things that you can do when you're not really sure what it looks like would be so helpful. As I was listening back to this episode, I kept having thoughts about the book Values and Therapy that was written by Jenna Lejeune and Jason Luoma. And I actually interviewed Jenna for my book on imposter syndrome that's, that's coming out in a few months. Because one of the strategies that she suggests, so once you have an idea of the values you want to embody more, you might struggle to know exactly how to kind of walk the walk of living those values. And one of the things she suggests is interviewing someone who you see doing a good job of living out that value. And I love this strategy. And I just kept thinking in this episode with Nedra, like what a cool way to think about boundaries. One of the things Nedra and I talk about is how you can't wait around for other people to change, that the change has to come from you, right? And so maybe you know, like, I need boundaries, I need change, but I'm not really sure exactly what to do or how to do it. And so I thought this strategy that that Jenna and I talked about, where you can look at someone, we probably all know somebody who does a really good job of setting boundaries. And so some of the questions that Jenna recommends are asking a person, so so in a values context, let's say the value is courage. It might be things like, what does living courageously mean to you? How have you put courage into practice? Have you always lived courageously? If not, what made you center this value and how are you able to make the change? So you can take courage and change that into something related to boundaries, right? So like, how does... How does living in a more with more boundaries or in a more boundaried way, what does that mean to you? How have you put boundaries into practice? Have you always been able to use boundaries? If not, what, how were you able to make this change? So here are a couple other questions. What have you noticed about yourself, your relationships, or your career since you started enacting boundaries? Have things changed for you? How do you think having boundaries impacts others? 
what gets in the way of choosing to have boundaries and what helps you when you're stuck. What do you think, Yael? Do you think that could be a helpful way just to like get really get moving if this is a change you're ready and willing to make? Totally. And and sometimes even if you're sort of more in like the contemplation stage, if you feel not quite ready, I think sometimes what keeps us not ready is that we don't really know what it's going to look like in sort of like when the rubber hits the road. So we feel a little bit like unsure about proceeding because we just don't even know what it would look like. And I'll just share, this is not about family dysfunction. It's about my difficulty with time management and setting boundaries on my time. But I recently am very excited because I'm going to be doing a newsletter on relationships with the growth equation, which is managed by Brad Stolberg, a a past guest that we had on to talk about his book, The Practice of Groundedness, and his colleague, Steve Magnus, who's also a terrific writer. And they have a great newsletter, and I'll be doing a sort of offshoot newsletter that talks about relationships. So I'm taking on this new thing. And one of the things that I really struggle with boundaries around is time. I feel like I constantly say yes to things because I'm really excited But I also really value sort of doing things in a non-chaotic way and not dropping the ball all the time. And Brad is somebody who has similar values to me in terms of sharing science and getting out there and writing and and really engaging in all sorts of ways around the, the things that he loves to do. But he seems to be very disciplined about his time. So I literally, we met yesterday to talk about some things related to the newsletter. And I literally found myself interviewing him. Like, what what do you say no to? How do you organize your time? When do you work out? I probably got a little too personal. <laughs> but it was so helpful to have him walk through sort of his thought process about the kinds of choices that he makes, sort of what goes into it. Because I'm aware that we have similar values in terms of, you know, making sure that we're present for our family and doing really being engaged in our work and and sort of being methodical about it. And so it was really helpful to sort of hear about like how he makes those choices and then like literally what his weeks look like and to use that information to sort of allow it to kind of give me a sense of what those choices around time boundaries can look like. So I do think that asking somebody who you really look up to who's doing a skillful job can really help to clarify for you and help you to feel more ready to make changes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. I'm that's, uh, that's so cool. I'm glad you actually just had that experience. And I think one of the things that's important about what you're saying is you were focusing on his process. It was more about how do you go about making these choices rather than, oh, you put exercise in your calendar. Okay. I'm going to put exercise in my calendar, right? It, it's not so much the content as the how you go about doing it. And that might be an important thing for people to think about in terms of like, you know, interviewing about boundaries. And you'll be interested to know, Yael, that what my next guest that I'm interviewing is Vanessa Patrick and her book is The Power of Saying No. So that might be a good one for you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, listeners, if you want your family to be more drama free, we hope that you find this episode with Nedra Tawab helpful in that domain. Hey, everybody. It's Jill here, and I have quite a treat for you today. I have Nedra Tawab coming back on the podcast. She was here a couple years back talking to Diana about her first book, Set Boundaries, Find Peace, and I have her back today to talk about her new book, Drama Free, A Guide to Managing Unhealthy Family Relationships. Nedra Glover Tawab, LCSW, is a New York Times bestselling author, licensed therapist, and sought after relationship expert. She has practiced relationship therapy for 15 years and is the founder and owner of the group therapy practice Kaleidoscope Counseling. Nedra earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. She has additional certifications in working with families and couples and in perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, plus advanced training for counseling adults who have experienced childhood emotional neglect. Nedra has appeared as an expert on Red Table Talk, The Breakfast Club, Good Morning America, and CBS Morning Show, to name a few. Her work has been highlighted in The New York Times, The Guardian, and Vice, and she has appeared on numerous podcasts, including The Good Life Project, Sophia with an F, and Therapy for Black Girls. She runs a popular Instagram account where she shares practices, tools, and reflections for mental health and hosts weekly Q&As. Nedra, welcome back to Psychologist Off the Clock. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. I love talking to fellow clinicians. Yes, me too. Well, your book is tremendous. 
right from the very beginning, I was I was totally drawn in. I just think there was so much that resonated with me personally, but also among the clients I've seen. And one of the the first things that occurred to me is how common it seems to be for people to really minimize their dysfunctional family issues. And maybe especially when they come from more privileged backgrounds or if they haven't been um, physically or sexually abused. So like almost like they don't feel like they have a right to feel the way that they do about their family of origin. So I thought maybe where we could start is if you could talk about what you mean when you say unhealthy or dysfunctional family relationships and and maybe give a few examples. I'm, I'm hoping that for any listeners who have struggled with family of origin issues, it would be helpful to hear like how many behaviors and patterns still count, if that makes sense, like even if it's not outright abusive. Yeah. Gosh, um, I think this function is any persistent unhealthy pattern. Sometimes that looks like competition within family relationships It can look like emotional neglect. It can look like substance abuse issues. It can also look like sibling rivalry. It could look like financial abuse, sometimes weaponizing money. And rich families and middle-class families face that as well. It is so many different things. And, you know, the way that I typically find out is through talking to a client. And you're like, oh, Here's an interesting issue. When you have something really great going on, your mother brings up what's happening with your siblings. Isn't that a dysfunctional pattern for her to shift the conversation away from you to everyone else? Isn't that dysfunctional too? So it's so many things. And I think we do only see it in the context of abuse and neglect. Like it has to be a really hard thing for us to have a problem. But it's also a really hard thing when I'm unable to talk to someone in my family. It's also a really hard thing when my emotional needs are going un notice. It can also be a really hard thing when every time we get together on the holidays, we argue about politics. There are so many different things that happen within families that therapists are starting to need new resources to address. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that really struck me, like all the very different ways that this can happen and, 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 and the ways people can be affected. And one of the examples you use in the book have many different kind of case examples that I think really bring this to light. And, you know, there were so many, there were, there are even notes I took in the book where I wrote me too, you know, just, you, you can really see yourself in here. I think, you know, there, there, there is something for everyone in this book. And so there was one example, I think her name was Carmen and she was a person who pointed out family dysfunction while everyone else around her, you know, in the family would accommodate the dysfunction and then sort of turn it around on her, like making it out that she was really the problem. And so I'm curious, that was something that resonated with me personally. And and so I was curious about how common that is to have kind of like an identified bad guy if they point out legitimate family dysfunction. Is that like, what do you think is going on here? And how can people like Carmen know that they're really seeing what they're seeing and aren't just like troublemakers, so to speak. Carmen will have to seek support outside of her family. It's really hard to be in a dysfunctional system where many of the other folks are not ready to change. And as a part of them not changing, they have to deny what the reality is because they can't really face it. In those situations, the person calling out the behavior, the person who is saying, oh my gosh, did you see this big issue? It's like, this has been happening so long, Carmen. What are you talking about? Why are you bringing light to this situation? It's really unfortunate. And it's actually a form of gaslighting when we really think about it for a person to reshape the reality to fit what they want to have or to reshape it, to make it sensible for them and to disregard what's actually happening. I first started to see this a lot in the families with addiction. You know, when there's a person who says to their parent, oh my gosh, dad is an addict or mom is an addict. 
when people aren't ready to address that, it's like, that's your mother. It's not that big of a deal. She can come to your party. Everybody else is sort of dealing with this behavior. And you're the one who's saying, but it's problematic. We don't see this. She's, you know, I, I listened to a podcast the other day where a guy was talking about his mother being anorexic. And his father would never notice it. He really fed into the mom's behavior. Oh, she just has lots of stomach issues. There's nothing going on with her. So everyone tried to make him seem as if you're, it's really not that big of a deal. She just has all of these gastrointestinal issues and she, you know, doesn't like to eat with us and, you know, all of these excuses. And he's like, am I being a butthole? Am I being, you know, am I being a hell raiser by saying, mom, you need to eat? Mom, you need to see a doctor and be honest with them. But that's how his family made him feel. And unfortunately, his mother ended up passing away because of her issues with eating until her death. No one else acknowledged that she had any issues with eating except for this person. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really is gaslighting. I think anytime there's that sort of, you know, people can't see me right now, but I'm kind of looking around, looking back and forth, like, am I crazy? Am I the only yeah. one that sees this? Like, how is it that everyone else around me doesn't think that this is the problem? It must be me that I, how am I the only one? But I, I do think it's, it's so much easier for people to put their head in the sand, because if you admit there's a problem, then there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard to acknowledge it. And in many cases, you know, people may choose not to because they're not ready to do any work. And it's not always that they support the problem, but they also aren't supporting the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. It's a lot harder to kind of call out someone's problematic behavior and attempt to have some sort of intervention therein than it is to just keep pretending everything is fine and you know, you're just a troublemaker. You're just making waves. We're yeah. all over here. Yeah. yeah. I've also heard of people acknowledging it secretly. They won't say it mm. to um, the person in their presence, but they may pull you aside and say, you know, Jill, you, you're right about that. Yeah. And that's that's all they can give you. They won't advocate for you. They won't stand up with you. But in secret, right. there may be a person who's able to say like, you are seeing what you see. It is accurate, but yeah. they want, they don't have that commitment to continue in their behaviors with that person. Yeah. And I wonder too, so, and this is something that has happened to me where in my own family, a substance abuse was finally acknowledged, but when the abuse, the substance abuser was sort of called out, like, this is a problem. Let's do something about this. When that person didn't say, you're right, I have a problem, I need help, everybody backpedaled, Mm. right? When that person was like, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm fine. This is you. This isn't me. It Then it was harder to keep pushing and pushing. So everybody backpedaled. And then I was kind of that one still in that position of like, wait, what, what, what? Mm -hmm. But we, but we, Mm -hmm. but we all agreed. We all see that it's a problem. Like what, what's what's happening? You know, as soon as it became something that was going to be much more challenging to, to address and keep called out, it, it suddenly became less of a problem. And maybe we can, we can talk a little more in in a minute or so about, um, you know, some of the obstacles to change what we can change and can't change and some of the obstacles, but I, I wanted to, but before we go there, you you shared some, I mean, what I can only call kind of like truth bombs right in the first, I think it was like the first 15 pages of the book that I thought were a really important place to start. And so I'm going to give just a quick quote. Um, one of the things you say is, we carry the weight of the years when we were most powerless as if we have to continue that way. But adulthood gives us the opportunity to change our narrative. So that's one. You also said, you are not what happened to you. And then the other thing you point out, I don't think this is a quote. This was just a note I wrote down, but that we can't change other people and we can't change the past. The only thing we can change, of course, is ourselves. And so I definitely want to spend some time talking about changing the narrative and ourselves. But can you first talk a little bit about, we've talked about the ways, we've talked about examples of what dysfunction might look like. What are some ways that childhood dysfunction can impact 
people and their adult relationships? Like, what do you see in your adult clients who have had um, family dysfunction as part of their their picture, their history? Mm. Well, I work with couples. So mm. with couples, I see two people coming together and being their parents or trying to be the direct opposite of their parents or bringing any of those family patterns right into their marriage, into their partnerships and their dating experiences. Because if we don't notice it, we don't do anything about it. So often people are, I don't want to be like my dad. I'm like, you describe yourself in a way that I've heard you describe your mother. And people don't even realize it. That Wait, how does that go over when you do that? You know, so my, my husband knows he better not. <laughs> well, I, I say, in such, nah, I'll say, who mm. does this remind you of? Mm. There you I go. won't say yeah. who the person is, but I will say, who does this remind you of? Yeah, And I may give them some, some clues, you know, the person who doesn't understand, no, the person who doesn't, you know, and there'd be my mom. Yeah. 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 I, I I hear a little bit of that because people sometimes don't even know the way in which they are displaying these qualities that they don't want to have. Sure. They're, they right. are, I mean, you would hope if they are aware of it, then they would, they would change it. They wouldn't be doing it. And so often it is, it is outside of awareness. Very much so. And it can be in, in work relationships and friendships, um, I see a lot of women sometimes who struggle with accepting help from from anyone, from friends, from family, because they were so responsible as children. And and you know, I have to tell them perhaps that tool that that skill was needed in childhood. Mm -hmm. Do you need that skill at thirty? I don't think so. I don't think you need to do everything anymore. Clearly, it's stressful. It probably was stressful when you were 12, but now you have people saying, what do you need? What do you need? At 12, you didn't have that. So how do we get you to live in the now? How do you release that part of yourself that you don't even need anymore? Yeah, I think it's so huge. I mean, there are so many behavioral patterns that we develop in our younger years that worked at that time. They're, they were adaptive, protective, safe, you know, whatever. And then no one ever comes and says to us, unless we get into th therapy later, but no one says, Hey, you know, your situation and your context has changed. You don't have to do that anymore. You can do something differently now. And that, you know, that can be a real aha moment, I think, for people mm -hmm. to realize, Oh, right. Me sort of wearing my suit of armor back then, me not letting people get in close, me not trusting people, you know, that, that was adaptive at that time, but I don't need to do that anymore. And in fact, doing that now is really harming me. Yes. You know, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, I'm thinking your context has, has shifted and so should your behaviors. Right. Right. It's huge. Well, let's talk about trust for a second, because that's something you do address in the book that, you know, trust issues are one thing that can result from dysfunctional family relationships. And I, I bring this one up specifically because I see it so frequently in my practice. And it feels a little hard for folks to tackle because at the end of the day, trust is a leap of faith. Like it's mm -hmm. something that we have to choose even when it will always be uncertain. You know, I mean, I, I, I'll give the example to clients that I feel pretty confident that my husband isn't cheating on me, but at the end of the day, I have no idea. Like there's no way for me to really know that unless I follow him around every second of every day. And then that's going to do damage to our relationship in its own right. So ultimately this is a leap of faith that requires us to, to sit in uncertainty. And, and that's tough for people, especially if they have been betrayed or, or had, you know, had, um, had their trust violated in the past. So do you have any specific tools or recommendations that you use with your clients who really want to be able to trust, but struggle to kind of take that leap? I encourage them to practice trusting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you, you, you said a wonderful thing that you have to take the leap. And so when I notice their ambivalence, I will say, what can you do to trust this situation? It's a behavior. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this person will. 
what does trust look like in this situation? What is a trust practice that you can implement with this person? Because they haven't let you down yet. You're you're right. stopping them from having the opportunity to meet an expectation or let you down. Right. So, well, I love this too in, in framing it as a behavior and in this moment right now. It doesn't have to be either you trust everyone completely or you don't. It's what's one thing you can do in this particular context or relationship that is trust. And it could even just be a baby step, right? It could be just sharing one personal detail about yourself without sharing the whole the whole vault. Mm-hmm. You know? And sometimes I use a therapeutic relationship as an example of how you may engage in other other relationships. I've had clients who are very guarded with me. I mean, it's it's like, okay, well, let's play tic-tac-toe for eight sessions before we'll have something <laughs> to talk about because you're not saying anything, right? And so I use that when they get to the point of comfort and then they're trying to explore other relationships. I remind them of what I saw. Mm, I remember when you first started coming here and, oh my gosh, you would just sit on this one part of the couch and your legs would be so tight. And every question I asked, it was like I was doing a little interview. It wasn't a conversation. And look at you now after you've started to trust me. I love that. I wonder how you can start to open up maybe sooner in some Mm -hmm. relationships because everybody isn't going to give you eight weeks. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. I'll give you eight weeks, but that's not, that's not the real world. Yeah. And, and then there's so much else you could even unpack from that in terms of what do you notice about the quality of our relationship in the first four weeks? And how is that different from how it is now? You know, kind of pointing mm-hmm. out like, what was it that you needed to feel safe in order to be willing to start trusting? And in what ways has your willingness to trust me improved our relationship and our work together. You know, you can kind of like point out experientially the way that these things influence one another to then hopefully create more willingness to now take that outside of the the therapy room. There's a lot inside of that therapy relationship, I think, that can be useful there. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So both of your books, of course, have a big emphasis on boundaries And I also, so that I don't forget, I also do want to emphasize that you have an incredible social media presence and your Instagram account. I feel like every post you have, I don't know how you have as much content as you do, (laughs) but every single post I get something out of, I tell so many of my clients about it. So I, I really recommend it to listeners. It is such a helpful, you know, like bite sized advice that you can really use and enact in an, in an immediate way. And a, and a lot of it, of course, is about boundaries. So um, let's, before we really dive into boundaries, can you define what you mean when you use the word boundaries? I mean, needs are expectations in our relationships with other people. When you grow up in dysfunctional families, unfortunately, boundaries are very blurry. And often you are not allowed to have them. And so a part of your landscape is being without boundaries. And so much of who you are is this boundaryless person who has to learn that it is okay to have needs. It makes sense to have expectations, not just for other people, but also for yourself. Because sometimes when you have no boundaries, you become a people pleaser, extreme people pleaser. Mm -hmm. Um, I think most people are people pleasers, but I'm going to say extreme people pleaser, where you have nothing left for yourself, or you become extremely self-neglectful, or you Mm -hmm. become a yes person, and those things aren't good. And those are things that we sort of do to ourselves. Those aren't things that other people are doing to us. So, you know, boundaries are really an important way that we show up in our relationships with other people. And most people have boundaries. I hear a lot of people like, oh my gosh, I need so much help. I don't have any boundaries. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you have some. I don't know what those are, but we can certainly do a discovery. And I bet you have some, and we need to get you to a place where you can have them in other places. Mm 
There are people who have wonderful boundaries with work, but they can't say anything in their family relationships. Right. And I imagine that comes from a place of in what context are they experiencing fear, you know, fear yeah. that they will have a loss of a relationship, that someone will be disappointed or that they'll hurt the person, you know, maybe they don't care if they hurt their coworker. You know, that feels like a risk that's easier to take, but when it comes to my parent or sibling, you know, the stakes probably feel higher. And and it could be the opposite for someone else. They may feel terrified that they could lose their job, so they have terrible boundaries at work, but they're fine having boundaries at home because they feel safe with their family members. And I I liked what you said, this is often something we do to ourselves, because I think often we may have a tendency to blame other people, blame family members for what they're doing or their behavior and sort of feel helpless and powerless. But this is really kind of an answer is, you know, you do have some power and part of that power is in your boundaries. Do you think that's that's an accurate way to, to conceptualize what you were saying? I think that is very accurate, that boundaries are a really powerful force for yourself with others. Yeah, yeah. And so you were talking about some of the ways that not having boundaries can present, being a people pleaser, et cetera. It seems to me, too, you talk quite a bit, actually, in the book about codependency. And that seems like it is primarily an issue with boundaries. Do you think that's that's right? If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus, when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T H R I V E market.com slash P O T C thrive market.com slash P O T C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love whole life pet whole life pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out whole life pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. That is 100% an issue with boundaries, I <laughs> meant. The idea that who someone is, is enmeshed with who you are, what they do, everything that they do impacts what you do or what you need to do for them. So they don't get to experience any discomfort. Um, I feel like codependency has been talked about so much, you know, in the last Mm -hmm. few years and sometimes it's been misplaced. You know, sometimes relationships are close and there are boundaries and it's like, that's codependent, they're close. I think codependency really happens when people start to experience dysfunction in their own lives as a result of being overly involved in other people's lives, right? When you are unable to take care of yourself because you are taking care of this other person who has the ability to care for themselves, but just is unwilling to do it. 
Right. And that, right. So there's the one side of the codependence is you're taking care of someone who can't take care of themselves, or you're allowing someone to take care of you when you can take care of yourself. Right. So it's like boundary issues in, in both, but sort of opposite directions. Well, and it makes me think about there's a section in the book too where you talk about the difference between enabling versus helping. So similar to this Mm -hmm. idea that a relationship might be very close and not codependent if it's not interfering. So I imagine in that version of a relationship, then behaviors are actually helping. Whereas in a truly codependent relationship, the behaviors are really more enabling. So can you talk a little bit about that distinction and like, how do we know where that line is between enabling versus helping? Oh, I'll give you an example. I've heard some parents say, I'm helping my adult child by paying their bills. Okay. How, how long have you been paying the bill for three months? Three months. Have they increased their income? No. Okay. Sounds like you have a new bill, mom. (laughs) Help would mean that they're starting to do something more to be able to take this away from you and do it themselves. Mm. Acquiring a bill is continuing to do the same thing for them every single month. You now have rent in another space, mom. And that's okay. <laughs> but that's what it is. That's not helping. No, you're right. And what you're saying is it's not about you don't distinguish between these two these two things based on what you're doing. You distinguish based on the the function or the process, like what what is your evidence? What do you see? Is this person changing? Are they getting better? Is there improvement? That's helping. But if they're staying the same or they're getting worse, then it's enabling. Absolutely. And there are so many times with family relationships that we label our help as helpful. You know, I've, I've, I always ask the question of how are they being helped? What improvements have you seen with this person? You have, you know, babysat their Kia every Saturday. What has changed in their life where they can start to maybe not need you anymore or they have some other solution? Are they, you know, moving towards something where this won't be a forever thing? And in many cases, it's like, no, it's, right. I don't know if you're helping them. I think you're allowing them to to go out and party and have fun and, uh, not be responsible for, for their kids. And it's only a reason sometimes because the person is complaining about it. They are doing something they don't want to do. They are doing something that they see as problematic. And that lets me know, oh, you don't even think you're being helpful. Right. You have a problem with the behaviors that you're implementing because now you're saying something about it, which is like the first sign of, oh, is this really an issue? Well, it is. You're talking about it. Yeah. So I wonder if like one one way to set boundaries in this case to, because sometimes you won't know right away whether something's helpful or enabling. So one form or example of a boundary might be a time limit. So let's say I say, well, I'm just helping until they get back on their feet because something hard mm-hmm. maybe has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, how long do you think it's going to take for them to get back on their feet? Like what would be a reasonable amount of time for us to start to see some evidence of that change? So maybe you pay the rent or whatever it is for three months or six months, but at some point there needs to be Mm -hmm. some, you know, uh, like if you're looking at a line graph, there needs to be improvement over time or some point at which you can say like, okay, now you need to go continue to do this on your own. Yeah. There does need to be some shift in what's happening and a very clear expectation of, I can, I will help you for three months. And it could be Mm -hmm. a reduction. It doesn't have to be a complete cutoff. It could be, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll give you a little stipend after three months. I'll, instead of giving you 400, I'll give you 300 in the next three months out. You know, it's not about like cutting people off, but Mm -hmm. how do you help a person become sufficient? How do you help them become um, someone who can take care of certain things in their life? How do you help someone understand that, you know, I love you deeply, but I may also need support. And so these are some things that that we have to talk about in our relationships that's not being mentioned, you know, yeah. as since we're on the topic of adult children, you know, I've heard parents say that the relationship with their adult child is very gimme, 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 but they don't hold any space for the parent. 
Mm-hmm. They don't, they're not, hey mom, how is your day? What's going on with your friends? And that's when we start to teach them, I am a person too. I have right. needs. It shouldn't too. just be transactional. It should be our Yeah, and I understand I'm your 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 dad and I've been cooking for you for 18 years, but can you start coming over on Sundays and, and prepare a meal for me? <laughs> can you invite us over to your house? Can you come down out of your bedroom and maybe help me cook? You know, right. so these are things that are also boundaries, transitioning that relationship so it is more reciprocal and not so transactional can be a right. wonderful boundary for adult children. Right. I love that. Well, let's talk a little bit about change. So one of the things you talk about in the book is how one way people try to deal with dysfunctional relationships and that maybe is like well-meaning is like, I just have to learn how to be more tolerant of this person. But ultimately that often means feeling more resentful rather than patience, which is m- what we might be going for. So you recommend instead changing the things that we no longer want to tolerate. So what do you think are the most common obstacles to making those changes to instead of just continuing to tolerate someone's bad behavior, or maybe it's easier to continue tolerating someone's bad behavior. Like you might see that you really need to make a change, but get something gets in the way of doing that. What do you think are the things that get in the way? I would say number one is we are waiting for this other person to magically change overnight. It's like we're, we've been watching too many Disney movies and we think, oh my gosh, they're going to bump their hair tomorrow, get struck by lightning, and they're going to wake up a different person or in someone else's body and they'll be great. And it's like, that's not what happened with people. That thing that they did last week, they will continue to do that thing. So the change will happen on your part, not on theirs. So if you're wanting something different, what is that thing that you want in the relationship? Increasing your tolerance for poor behavior, for mistreatment, for um, competitiveness, for abuse in some cases is not a reasonable strategy. Yeah. You don't have to tolerate more. You just made me have a little bit of an aha moment because it's not just Disney movies. It's every single book, TV show, and movie we have ever watched. Every single character has a character arc, and they typically grow and evolve and change from the beginning of the story to the end. So we're really inundated with these messages that these things happen, right? Mm -hmm. So it, I mean, that's really interesting that you don't even realize, like, I mean, it's just sort of in the water that like this person's going to grow and change, right? If I just wait long enough, or if I just quote unquote, help a little more, even if that helping is actually enabling. And yeah, and that really, it has to be on us. And we can certainly hope that they go through that transformation, but that, that, you know, if we want to take care of our ourselves, we really have to be the ones that are changing. Yeah. And I, I think of this, I think for people who experience trauma or who, maybe in certain circles where change is not encouraged or they may feel like life is great as it is, or they may be emotionally immature or any sort of thing where they are unready, they are unwilling to change. Expecting them to grow up because they're aging is unreasonable. Yeah. And we really have that expectation of people like because this person is 65 they will have all of these life skills. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't think your aging body means a growing <laughs> mind. Right. It just means that your bot you have gray hair. Yeah, <laughs> gray hair doesn't so actually mean wisdom. <laughs> right. right. It just means your hair is turning a different color. That's it. Yeah. That's all that's <laughs> happening. So, so often we look at, especially our elders or, you know, just people in the world, our friends sometimes when they've been doing stuff for eight years and you're like, it's been eight years. It's like, they are just yeah. waking up every day with the same mind. Maybe their body is changing. Their mind is not changing. Right. Well, these patterns develop for a reason. And like we were saying before, like they worked at some point. And if you don't 
identify that it's happening and that it's no longer working and do the work to change it, it's just going to continue in, in much the same way that it always has. Absolutely. So um, as we're thinking about increasing our to- tolerance for for things, we have to stop ourselves from doing that. You yeah. know, I get a lot of questions around, how do I deal with my mother yelling at me? And I'm like, deal with it. Like, you want to improve your tolerance to be yelled at? I don't, I guess you just sit there and you let somebody, I don't want to encourage that. I would say, you know, maybe when a person starts to yell at you, you make a statement, you say, hey, you're yelling. This isn't a good time for us to talk. I'm going to go ahead and call you back later or call me back once you're calmed down. I don't know if you sit there and you tolerate it better. Yeah. So that, this is a great segue because I want to ask you about like, what are some specific examples, like, like strategies for boundary setting or, or, or other strategies. It doesn't have to just be boundary setting, but if we are wanting to do a better job with the dysfunctional family relationships that are around us, and we know we can't sit around and wait for other people to change and that we cannot change other people. What are some examples of things that you have taught people to do differently if they have a yelling mother or they have a, I mean, there's so many different examples of the way dysfunction Mm -hmm. could play out, Mm -hmm. but can you think of maybe some that stand out to you from, uh, or that have been particularly helpful with clients that you've had? Mm. I'm thinking of a situation where a parent clearly has a favorite child. And the expectation is, okay, when I go home this holiday season, things are going to be fair this year. They are going (laughs) to not ask me to do so many things while allowing this person to relax. They're going to ask me to do these these special projects with them there. And it it typically doesn't happen that way. The person goes home for the holiday. They re-experience the stuff that they always experience and they're upset again. So how do you go into a situation like that with a different expectation? You know, Mm -hmm. if a parent is clearly showing some favoritism, I've even heard of it where the parent will, will give a certain child better sleeping accommodations or something like, you know, like. Oh, this person needs it because it's like, no, they don't. (laughs) Do you need to stay with your parent if that's the case? Mm -hmm. Do you want to to sit in a house where this will constantly happen over and over? You have to experience it. Do you want to see your parents for the holiday? Yes. How do you need to visit them? Do you need to stay in the same home? If you stay in the same home, do you have to be in the same room with all of your family at the same time? Are there other activities you might want to do in that city with with other people? Do you want to bring a support person with you to maybe break up some of that energy? There is a whole arsenal of things that you can do instead of going into that situation, expecting those people to be different. Yeah. Well, and and what really stands out to me about this is everything you're, you're saying in that example actually has nothing to do with anyone else. And I think maybe sometimes, I don't know if it's a mistake, but the intention is to be assertive and to change the situation. But so for example, maybe it's, you know, I'm going to have a conversation with this parent and say, you know, I, when you always give my brother the better room, it makes me feel like I'm not as important. And it would really mean a lot to me if you could consider, you know, that we would switch off every other time. You know, this seems like it's a really effective communication strategy, but it's still relying on the outcome of someone else's behavior. Right. And then that can be so demoralizing and frustrating when it doesn't actually yeah. work. And the kinds of boundaries you're talking about, it, there's no way it can't quote unquote work because it has nothing to do with outcome or other people. It's strictly what I'm going to do to take care of myself in this situation with these people that all of which are unlikely to change. I love that. And I, and I think also in that situation, Let's say they start to do every other year, your brother gets the room, then you get the room, that sort of thing. That's just one situation. 
It's probably mm-hmm. tons of situations. So you'll constantly have to correct every single thing. Hey, right. you fix this person's plate first. Hey, you're complimenting them endlessly in front of me. Hey, you didn't ask me to go to the store with you. Hey, I mean, it's going to be so many different things that you yeah, will have to like say whack-a-mole. to this person. Yeah, it's like, okay, right. here's another oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Here's another one. Here, here's yeah. another one. <laughs> Right. And what I can do instead is like knowing that there are going to be so many different things that are going to trigger this distress in me, I'm just going to limit the amount of time or my limit my amount of exposure by getting a hotel or by only coming for the day instead of the weekend or, you know, whatever the case may be in terms of the specific boundary. Yeah. I think it's very mm-hmm. common for parents to have codependent relationship with one of the children and the other children are just watching. And it's typically the mm-hmm. one who, you know, they feel needs the most help. You know, they're not able to do whatever. And all the rest of the siblings is like, well, we did it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, why do you think this person won't be able to, <laughs> to do this thing? And it, it causes issues, not just in the parent child relationship, but even your relationship with that sibling for receiving the help. You know, there's yeah. a lot of resentment that they're even allowing themselves to be helped in this way while other people are being excluded. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm guessing this is probably a question that you get pretty commonly, but how do you help people decide if they're asking you, listen, I've got these dysfunctional family relationships. It's like really causing me a lot of distress and trouble. And I don't know if maybe I should just cut my mother off or if I just need to find a different way. Do I just try setting boundaries or is an estrangement more called for? That doesn't typically come up in that very direct way. What typically happens is they're complaining about the parent a lot and we start talking about boundaries. Their boundary might be cutting the parent off. Or we talk about other things they can do in that relationship with the parent or with the sibling or whoever the family member is. I typically do not recommend someone cut off a parent because it's a a decision that you'll have to live with. Mm -hmm. And so that recommendation is pretty tough. The only time that I might even consider saying that is if the the relationship is violent Mm -hmm. or abusive. That's the only time I could think to say that. But a lot of these things, it's so much gray in there that there there could be room for boundaries or you might choose to leave it. And it's really up to you to decide because there is no one way to handle a parent who is narcissistic. There is no one way to handle a sibling that never listens to you. There's no one way to handle any situation in the family. And it's really based on an individual's capacity to be in that relationship or not. Yeah. I sometimes pose it to clients like, you know, you can, you can cut this person off completely or you can keep things exactly the way they are. And I'm holding my hands up now to sort of show Mm -hmm. two ends of a spectrum And then what's in between are many, many, many different options, you know, Mm -hmm. and like lots of different things that you can try and see how it goes, you know, to try to get a little bit of flexibility and away from this very like all or none, black or white. I find that sometimes, you know, when people are saying they want to cut someone off as their sort of first line of defense, it's coming more out of a place of avoidance, that it feels so hard to figure out how to navigate boundaries and how it's going to go and how to deal with it if it doesn't go well and to deal with the guilt and the, the, that for some people it's like, no, I'm just forget it. I'm just going to cut them off. And that feels like it's a little impulsive or not thoughtful. Whereas if it's somebody who says... I've tried, here are 15 examples of boundaries I've tried. And this person, you know, it's very evident that this is a very toxic relationship, but it's thoughtful. They've considered it over time. They've tried things. And then that feels like it's really the only option, that it's Mm. like the function of the decision about how you're going to navigate these difficult relationships that I think sticks in my mind a bit. Yeah. I I think people have to make their own choices. And 
I also believe we don't know all of the client's story. And so it's very hard for me to say, based on what you've said here is a prescription for that. I think you will have to decide what to do. I will say that even cutoffs have consequences. The relationship with other family members, the the grief or guilt you might feel, um, you know, certain anniversary dates that come up and you have thoughts about this person. So, you know, that comes with its own set of things to deal with. Now, in many cases, people see it as a relief. They feel much better not talking to this chaotic person or this person who caused a lot of problems in their life. I will say family relationships don't have to be close. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people are trying to force a close relationship with a family member. If they don't talk to them every day, then that's the equivalent of cutting them off. It's like, well, you could talk to that person once a week. I wonder Mm -hmm. how that would feel. I wonder how it would feel if you answered your phone when you wanted to listen to them complain or, you know, whatever it is that they do. What would that feel like? It doesn't have to be a regular routine sort of relationship, you can define the frequency. Right. Right. And I think the other, the other piece of this that's important that you're saying is if you stay in a dysfunctional relationship, there's going to be pain that comes with that distress of uh, different kinds. If you completely cut them off, there's going to be pain that comes with that. And if you Mm -hmm. maintain the relationship and have boundaries, there's going to be pain that comes with that. No matter how you slice it, there are going to be elements of this that are difficult and distressing. And so if your sole reason for excommunication or not setting boundaries, whichever end of that spectrum it is, if your sole reason for that is to try to stay in your comfort zone, that's probably not actually going to be effective. It's like, no matter what you choose, the bad news is no matter what you choose, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So like what, in terms of how you feel, right? Because no matter what, there's pain that's going to come with it. So like, what is the thing that really comes from a values driven place? Like who and how you want to show up in the world when it comes to these relationships? Um, You know, even, even if setting a boundary is hard, how can you do that? Even if you feel guilty or you get pushback, if, if excommunicating someone is the right thing to do for you, how can you do that? Even though there's going to be grief that, that may come along with that, but so not letting the feelings drive, but really letting kind of like the values be in charge of, of whichever direction you take. Yes. What are some ways that you recommend people handle the guilt and the grief? I imagine this comes up a lot, whether people are setting boundaries. I mean, I think anytime you change a family system, there can be some of those difficult feelings, guilt, grief, et cetera. Is, are there any tips that you give people for what to do when that shows up? I mean, I imagine that becomes an obstacle to change in the first place. And then once people really do it, like how do they stick with it? if a lot of those feelings show up as a consequence. We have to reframe the grief. Are you doing a bad thing or do you feel Mm -hmm. bad about doing a necessary thing? If you feel bad about doing a necessary thing, is that grief? Is that guilt? Or is that you feel as if you're letting someone down? You Mm -hmm. miss the person. You're sad about it not working out. So I think there's a lot of reframing work that we can do to move a person away from the guilt and to move them towards really processing the loss of the relationship or the loss of what the relationship could be. Yeah. It's amazing, I think, how often we think we can't tolerate letting someone down or disappointing them. You know, it may be that someone is disappointed if we're limiting our our contact with them in some way and that maybe that can be okay. Like maybe they can handle being disappointed and we can handle the fact that they're disappointed. Like I don't have to convince you they're not disappointed. They may be disappointed, but that's okay. Like that's not your problem to fix. Yes. Um, You know, real truth is you will disappoint people and they will disappoint you. Many of the people that that are disappointed at us have disappointed us. And there was no one there to stop you from being disappointed. You had to process it and now they are processing it. I think that's a part of relationships, sometimes being disappointed with the other person. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, we're we're just about getting to the end here. I did want to bring up one other thing that I really appreciated, and it was when you were talking about kind of how to handle pushback from other family members. So um, mm-hmm. I wrote down one of the things you had written, which was uh, you had given some suggestions for what you might say. So if my brother is stealing from me, and that means I need to set boundaries with him, but I'm getting pushback from other family members, one way I might try to uh, defend the decision, I don't know if that's quite the right word, but is to say, like, if this were someone I was dating and I told you they were stealing from me, would you say I should stay with that person? And then it becomes so much more clear, like, oh, no, you're right. It's not okay to be taken advantage of in that way. And that was just something I thought, I found that really helpful. And and I thought I would share an example of my own because I actually do have a, a situation in our family where my brother and I, he's in prison and he and I are estranged, but he still has a relationship with my other brother and my dad. And for a long time, my dad was, you know, he was not cruel about it in any way. He was sad that we were estranged and he was trying to encourage me to reconsider the relationship, which at at least for right now, I, I'm not willing to do. And at one point I said to him, you know, dad, I don't try to talk you out of your relationship with him. So I would really appreciate it if you would not try to talk me into having one, right? Like as a way to say like, Mm, we can mm -hmm. handle this differently and I'm not going to try to change the way you're doing your thing. So I would mean a lot if you would respect me, you know, that I'm choosing. And that really, that really hit him. He got it. He was like, oh, Mm -hmm. you're right. And it's a silly example, but I always think about that with pregnancy. Like whenever someone says, oh, I don't want to have kids, People feel compelled to talk you into having kids. Mm -hmm. And I once said to someone, listen, I don't try to talk you out of having kids. Why are you trying to talk me into it? And then people go, oh, you're right. That would be so weird if you tried to talk people out of having kids. Yeah. You know, so this was something that, that really resonated. And then, you know, luckily I didn't, I didn't hear about it again. So I didn't know if you had any other thoughts about how folks can deal with that pushback, I mean, even the guilting, even sometimes gaslighting that Mm. can come from other family members when that one person really does start to set healthy boundaries for themselves. I will certainly start to use what, what you said. That was a beautiful example. And also, as you mentioned in the book, helping people to get outside of the people involved and moving them towards general. In general, if a person did X, what is the appropriate response? Would you be okay with this if it were a friend of mine? And when it goes back to, yes, I would be okay with it if it were a friend, but not your brother. It's like, well, for relationships, should we lower the standard for family? Right. Or should we have a general standard of how we should be treated in relationships? Yeah, I love that. There's, I think you mentioned the kind of the 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 blood is thicker than water type mentality, but in reality, like as humans, isn't it okay for us to just have a basic set of standards for how we expect to be treated by other humans, whether we're related to them or not? Yeah, yeah. Well, there is so much more in this book that, of course, we didn't have time for. I mean, there's a whole chapter on substance use problems. There's a lot more around specific to mental health, um, suggestions for specific struggles with parents, siblings, children, extended family, in-laws, blended families. Um, So really, I mean, there's just so much more in here that we didn't get to. So if for listeners, if you want your family relationships to be drama free, I encourage you to pick up Nedra's book that is also called Drama Free, A Guide to Managing Unhealthy Family Relationships. If people want to get more of you, where can they find you? Instagram is a wonderful place, but also any other social media platform and my website, nedratawab.com. And Tawab is T-A-W-W-A-B. I always, I always like, wait, is it two W's and one B or one W and two B's? So it's <laughs> T-A-W-W-A-B. So nedratawab.com. And then on, on social media, you're at nedratawab as well. Yes, I did not need to make up a name. That one was certainly not taken. <laughs> it was not taken? No. <laughs>
(laughs) (laughs) I love it. Well, this was such a great conversation. So helpful. I really appreciate you coming back to talk to us again. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Hey, Psychologist Off the Clock listeners. I'm going to guess that if you got to the end of this episode, that you also love to geek out about books in psychology. If you don't know where to store all your books and people are already complaining that you talk about this book that you're reading all the time, then why don't you join us once a month to read a book together? If you're interested in joining us, we hope you are. Just send an email to offtheclockpsych at gmail.com and we'll send you more information. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter and connecting with us on social media. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, and our podcast production manager, Jadine Stout-Williams. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.